Hello and welcome to GCV Analytics webinar. Today uh, we have a very special webinar where we are going to be uh, tackling an intricate issue uh, of the legal realm um, and we've entitled it uh, FIRMA or the Foreign Investment Risk Review Modernization Act and the new role of uh, CFIUS um, with respect to foreign investments in the US. And we're going to focus the presentation particularly on uh, corporate backed uh, VC investments. Um, so here along with me, I have our uh, founder and editor-in-chief, uh, James Mawson. Welcome, Jim. Hey, Kellyanne. Delighted to be back again once again. And uh, this is a super interesting, important topic and feels very timely. So great to, great to catch up on this. Yeah, absolutely. And um, I I'm really, really delighted to have uh, as a guest speaker, uh, uh, Danish uh, Hamid. A partner at DLA, uh, DLA Piper, um, a legal firm that uh, has uh, backed us and um, some of our some of our events very generously for a very very long time. Um, just a little bit of uh, a little bit of background on uh, Danish. Uh, he he focuses on cross border business transactions, uh, and, um, regulatory issues and internal investigations. He covers uh, anything from high risk uh, M and A uh, transactions through uh, outsourcing, licensing, joint ventures, and uh, foreign government and military contracts. Um, he count he counsels both um, U.S. and foreign clients on a variety of regulatory issues. Uh, and here he is really the person to talk to. Um, if uh, you and your company is affected by the recent international trade wars, um, he advises companies on national security reviews and filing with uh, filings with uh, uh, CFIUS. In terms of his academic background, uh, which is just as impressive, um, he holds a law degree from the University of Oxford, and uh, he uh, got his JD from uh, George Washington University. So, uh, Danish. Um, uh, let me extend a very, very warm welcome uh, to you to this webinar, and uh, big thanks for uh, making the time uh, the time to do it with us. Welcome. Thank you, Kellyanne and Jim. I really appreciate the opportunity to join forces with you and discuss this fascinating topic. All right. Um, before we before we uh, give you the word, uh, Danish, we we uh, I'm, I just want to. I prepared a few slides with which I want to give a bit of a, a bit of a background on uh, foreign investing within the uh, corporate venturing realm. And um, on this uh, on this graph that I've prepared here, what it shows basically is uh, the evolution of um, corporate back deals uh, raised by U.S.-based startups within the past decade. Um, and what what we do see in the green and yellow stock bars is a uh, number of deals that have some um, some participation of, of foreign corporates. Um, in in the green one, uh, it's uh, it's it's foreign uh, foreign and domestic corporates co-investing in the same rounds. In the in the yellow one, it's it's just foreign uh, foreign corporates backing uh, backing the deal as part of the syndicate. And um, as we can see clearly on the lower part of, of the graph, uh, there is there, there is a very consistent there's a lot of a lot of consistency in terms of the number of uh, number of deals, number of uh, corporate back deals uh, that uh, feature a foreign investor uh, here. And um, you know we, we see that it's it's roughly a, between 40 to 45, 45 percent, and that hasn't really changed much over the past over the past decade. Um, if we look at if, if we try to give um, a ballpark sort of approximation of the um, capital inflows into U.S. corporate backed uh, corporate back deals, um, what we see is that uh, okay we have a fairly Fairly good and large number of deals uh, in the in the U.S. Uh, coming from from European corporates. Uh, then also uh, another big chunk of them uh, coming from the Asia Pacific region and uh, China being, of course, particularly particularly prominent and important. Um, we we saw Chinese corporates back 54 deals uh, that uh, totaled uh, 12.9 billion uh, last year. 
and um, just just as a just as a clear uh, just to clear something up, the dollar amounts are the total the totals of uh, of capital raised in the entire rounds. It it, it is not really possible um, to uh, give a reliable estimate of uh, of the actual capital inflows um, because uh, this sort of information is just not just not disclosed in um, in VC rounds. And that's um, that's how how it really works. So um, you know these, these, however, these uh, you know these numbers of deals and uh, total total dollars in those deals do give us uh, a fairly good idea as to what the proportion of these uh, these sort of investors is uh, when it comes to when it comes to foreign investing in uh, in VC and um, from the rest of the world. Oops, excuse me. Uh, from the rest of the world, we have a sort of a marginal marginal proportion as we can see. So as I mentioned, China is is quite prominent or seems quite prominent in, in and of itself. Um, however, if we look at the evolution by by region over the past uh, four or so years, we do see that uh, the China based uh, the, you know the the deals backed by China based corporates uh, have actually gone down in number from 107 in 2018 to to 54 last year, um, even though the total dollars in those deals did go up from uh, about 8.6 billion to uh, uh, 12.9 billion, um, which is a big, which is a big increase. Which which simply implies that um, Chinese corporates have invested in less, uh, in fewer deals, in fewer deals, uh, but more highly valued ones. Um, now, what's also interesting is to have a look at some of the some of the sectors um, that we might be talking about when we're interested in tech. So one of them is um, an indubitably life sciences and, and, and health. So we do see that roughly about half of uh, of all deals have some sort of for, uh, foreign uh, corporate investors. Um, when we look at the IT businesses that are slightly more sensitive, because you have things like AI, things like semiconductors and uh, other sorts of sorts of sensitive hardware. Um, here you see um, you, you see that it's uh, that it's about 40 to 45 percent, at least within the second half of uh, second half of uh, last decade. Um, and as uh, you know, as we see uh, the Tesla stock rising in recent times, so uh, we cannot. Uh, we cannot uh, but mention transport and mobility, and in that sector, we see that it's it's really been a lot more. It's more like seven sixty-five to seventy percent of deals in which you see foreign corporate backers uh, of U.S.-based um, mobility companies. So this is quite significant, and I know uh, Danish is is going to. Uh, is going to touch uh, touch on which industries have been affected by recent regulations much in, in much more detail. But I just wanted to give a give a broad sort of uh, broad sort of context. And um, with that, I conclude my part of the presentation. Um, I'm going to give the word now to uh, Jim for a few um, few remarks about uh, who we are and uh, what we do. Jim. Yeah, thanks, Kalyan. It's fascinating to see that data, and in particular, I think it's interesting, and I'll be keen to hear more about how Cepheus and Firma might start to impact the types of deals they've done, as well as from where. But certainly, anecdotally, you know, so a lot of the feedback we hear from the corporates is, you know, while perhaps some of the rules are focused on, you know, in particular, sort of China or non. Uh, conducive countries to sort of American government, you know, actually a lot of corporations have already said they've been impacted from other countries, whether it's Switzerland or the UK or Brazil, you know, that wouldn't necessarily be seen as targets for these types of regulations. And they're already saying that some of their deals or some of their activity is shifting. But it'd be great to hear more on what the rules and regulations that have just come out will mean in practice and how people can think about um, being able to sort of get and get the deals and what they want done uh, in an appropriate way. So just more about us, as you say, so Global Corporate Venture and 
you know, produces the data by talking to more than 3,000 corporations around the world about the deals that they're doing either directly or indirectly as a sort of limited partner in venture capital funds that creates GCV analytics, which kind of sort of leads and runs. Um, and so it allows us to do the analysis on what some of these trends you've just heard about. But that's just one of the things that we do within Global Corporate Venture, and we do a training academy, uh, and we identify the top 20% of corporations that end up doing 80% of deals, and they form the cohort that uh, that drives our leadership society so that best practices can be shared among the community. Uh, that's part of uh, one of the titles we do, we also do one at Global University Venturing, focusing on the sort of top 100 universities around the world and how they're supporting student, faculty, startups and spin-outs. And governments are particularly keen on the sustainable development goals, and we call that title Global Impact Venturing. And together, you know, we pull the whole of this community together through something which we call GCB Connect, which allows the algorithm to enable corporations to swap their portfolio companies between each other's. Uh, so that they'll just you can provide a capital, but also be a customer or supplier or help with the hiring and then exit in some ways as well. And enables new deals flows to come into the community through our partners such as Silicon Valley Bank. Next slide. And so as well as the um, sort of obviously the sort of data analysis by talking to the community, we get a good sense of what's going on and that news is produced through our monthly magazine and daily website, globalcorporventuring.com. And we do a number of different sectors as well as special reports throughout the year as well. Next slide as well. And then as I mentioned, by talking to the community, they very much look to share the best practices amongst them between themselves. And we do invite some sort of key individuals from outside the community, such as Scott Sandell from who's a managing partner of NEA or Scott Cooper from Andreessen Horowitz to come and present and talk and give a wider sense of what's happening in that innovation capital ecosystem at our conferences. We just held our GCBI summit in Monterey, California. It had more than 800 attendees and about $10 trillion of aggregate annual revenue from the corporations who attended and delighted their DLA Piper, one of our partners for that. So thanks very much, Danish, and uh, to your colleagues for that. Our GCB symposium is coming up in London uh, in June, 3rd and 4th. Um, and then we do others in New York, Houston, Israel, Brazil, uh, and Tokyo, uh, among others. So uh, thank you very much, Kalyan. So for the you know for the analytics, do get in touch with Kalyan uh, or obviously go on get in touch and look at the website pages. We've been partnering with Cubix Analytics in terms of developing the site for the data and presentations, but uh, anything more that we can do, not just on the data, but more broadly, don't hesitate to let us know. All right, um, thank you, Jim. Um, now I'm gonna give the word to um, to uh, Danish. Actually, before that, uh, one quick uh, housekeeping note uh, to the people watching us, uh, watching us live right now. Um, there must be a, a control panel appearing on the right hand side of your screen and on it there is a section called questions so if you do have any questions that may arise as we um, as we go along and as uh, Danish uh, acquaints us with uh, with the legal intricacies of, of this issue that we're discussing today uh, please do type in your questions and at the end of the presentation we are going to try to um, address them address them all um, so with that, with that said, um, Danish, uh, the um, the uh, presentation is yours. Um, so you could um, you could go go on with it. Thank you, Kellyanne. I am uh, uh, just trying to assume the controls of the slides here. Let me let me just should be working now. <laughs> Sorry about that. No. No. Well, I could, control, I, could, I could I could control the slides if uh, if that's uh, if that's easier. So um, let's um, shall we shall we start? Great. Yes, fantastic. All right, well, thank you everyone for joining us today. So this is Janish Hamid. I'm a partner in the Washington DC office where DLA Piper. Uh, I run a national security practice here. 
And as many of you know, there have been some significant regulatory enhancements to the Committee on Foreign Investment in the United States and U.S. National Security Reviews of Foreign Investments uh, in uh, U.S. businesses and also U.S. real estate. Get into the next slide there. So this is just sort of a big roadmap of what we're going to be discussing today. Uh, primarily, we're going to focus uh, on providing you with an overview of CFIUS. Uh, we'll discuss some key legal developments that have just uh, recently come into play, actually uh, as recent as last week. And then we'll uh, have a brief discussion in relation to the challenges that foreign investors typically face uh, in this area. So CFIUS, as, as you may know, is the Committee on Foreign Investment in the United States. It's an interagency government committee consisting of multiple members. The mission of CFIUS is to evaluate the screen foreign investments in the U.S. to determine their effect on U.S. national security. And if there is a concern, if there's a national security concern, then CFIUS has the ability to block or prevent uh, that investment from occurring uh, by informing the President of the United States. Uh, and then the president is authorized to block that investment. Typically, parties end up withdrawing before their deal goes before the president. However, notwithstanding all the uh, concerns regarding national security, uh, CFIUS, um, from time to time, reiterates the position that it would like to continue to encourage uh, foreign investment in the United States. Uh, they're, they're not seeking uh, to prevent foreign investment across the board, uh, but instead they're trying to strike what could otherwise constitute a, a fairly difficult balance, a challenging balance between protecting national security uh, while promoting U.S. free market system. So CFIUS is consisting uh, consists of several about nine different government agencies. They participate on the committee. It's headed by the Secretary of the Department of Treasury, uh, who acts as the chair of CFIUS. In addition to that, there are certain observing members and, and non-voting uh, members of CFIUS that inform the committee as to their views in relation to particular deals. Uh, some of those members come from the national security agencies of the United States. Now, when one thinks of national security concerns, obviously you'd, you'd associate that in, to the defense and aerospace industry. But recent CFIUS decisions, reviews have made it very clear that, and CFIUS itself has made it very clear that when it thinks about national security, it's not just limited to a single industry. Uh, national security concerns for CFIUS, for the U.S. government, can, uh, can, uh, can arise in a variety of industries. Obviously, the technology and the software industry uh, is very, very much high on CFIUS's radar. Uh, they, they are certainly uh, taking a, a fairly rigorous position in relation to reviewing deals, foreign investments in the tech sector. Uh, and more recently, social media has also attracted CFIUS uh, attention. Recent uh, investments, Chinese investments, for instance, in Grindr and TikTok, uh, have triggered CFIUS concerns. Uh, as you may know, you know, uh, an investment, a Chinese investment, or acquisition of Grindr was actually blocked by CFIUS because of national security concerns and the fact that access to potential sensitive personal data, personal information regarding U.S. citizens uh, that Grindr possesses by a foreign person uh, can raise national security concerns. Uh, we're also seeing uh, significant interest by CFIUS in other industri industries, including the financial services industry, because again, uh, those types of companies in that sector tend to have access to a huge amount of data regarding U.S. citizens. So when we think about national security in the CFIUS context, um, you know, there, there are a variety of factors that go into the mix, uh, but typically as a matter of due diligence. Um, you know, as an investor, you want to keep an eye out for, um, you know, target businesses that have, uh, you know, that participate in sensitive U.S. government contracts. Those could be a concern to CFIUS, as well as uh, businesses that are involved with critical technologies. Those are essentially technologies um, that are subject to U.S. export controls, and they're classified in a manner that would suggest that they're sensitive or that they're critical to the, uh, to the economy of the United States. 
In addition to that, um, CFIUS has expressed a strong interest in reviewing transactions, investments, and uh, you know, businesses that manage or, or help develop U.S. critical infrastructure, such as uh, you know, uh, the electric grids, telecommunications systems, transportation systems. Um, you know, it's a fairly lengthy list uh, of what constitutes critical infrastructure, but that's certainly very much high on CFIUS' radar. And then finally, as mentioned before, uh, sensitive personal data. So companies that gather, that have access to uh, um, sensitive personal data regarding U.S. citizens, especially data that a foreign person can leverage in an effort to, uh, you know, improperly influence a U.S. citizen who happens to also be a government official to exercise their government powers in a manner that would somehow harm U.S. national security, that too would be very much high on the CPS uh, radar. And then uh, finally, real estate transactions, you know, uh, both within the context of business acquisitions or investments or even separate from that. So more recent CFIUS regulations have made it clear uh, that CFIUS has the ability to review foreign investments in, in U.S. real estate, even if those investments don't involve targeting a U.S. business. So just moving to the next slide. So um, CFIUS has the ability to conduct reviews in, in a variety uh, of circumstances. In, in, in some instances, CFIUS could self-initiate a review with respect to a deal that's about to happen or that's, a, that's already occurred. CFIUS doesn't have, uh, it's not subject to any statute of limitations. And so it has staff that is responsible for monitoring public reports uh, press releases to determine if any uh, deals have occurred involving foreign investors that were not otherwise notified to the committee. And if CFIUS, based on those reports, thinks that there might be a concern, it, it could launch its own investigation and, and try and determine if this is something that would merit further review. Uh, in instances where um, you know there, there is a concern for CFIUS, then it would approach the parties um, and ask them to explain why they did why they did not notify uh, the committee. Now, under recent uh, regulations, there are certain circumstances where parties to an investment transaction are required to submit a mandatory declaration. And we'll be discussing what triggers that late in later slides. Um, but the main concern with mandatory declarations is that if you trigger a declaration, and if you don't submit it, then you can face a fine um, that could uh, be equivalent to the actual value uh, of the investment itself. So depending on the, the investment price, um, it could be a fairly hefty fine. And so that's something that parties need to be very careful about during the corporate due diligence stage. Separate from mandatory declarations, um, you know, if you don't trigger one, uh, you know, as a party to an investment, you may see that there might be other risks that may not necessarily trigger a mandatory filing requirement with CFIUS, but still, you know, could raise concerns for CFIUS. And as a matter of risk mitigation, certain parties may decide to submit a declaration, a short form declaration or a longer form notice to CFIUS on a voluntary basis. Uh, the benefit to that um, is that if you do submit the voluntary declaration or notice and a CFIUS uh, raises no objections, then what that means is that uh, as a party of the transaction, you receive a safe harbor protection that could protect you from uh, CFIUS challenges in the future. Um, and, and that could be handy, especially in instances where a foreign investor would be interested in engaging in follow-on investments. And so the submission of a, of a comprehensive voluntary notice could provide that shield, that protection in relation to future follow-on investments, as well as perhaps even a potential acquisition of uh, that U.S. business by, by the foreign uh, investor, if indeed they are pursuing um, you know, uh, their, their acquisition or their investments in various stages. And then finally, um, in instances where the parties haven't you know, submitted a mandatory declaration or a voluntary declaration, CIFIS itself has the ability to approach parties um, and tell them that, look, we see a concern here and we'd like for you to explain yourself, so please submit a notice to us. And obviously, if parties don't submit the notice, then they'll rub CFIUS the wrong way, and CFIUS may be more inclined uh, to advise the president that he should go ahead and block the deal. 
So what are the potential consequences of, uh, you know, filing uh, a declaration or a, a notice with CFIUS? Well, CFIUS could come back and, again, just inform the parties that they uh, have decided not to pursue any action. And that's, a good, that's oftentimes the best result. It means that you could receive uh, either partial or somewhat comprehensive safe harbor protection. Uh, alternatively, CFIUS could come back and to inform the party, parties that, look, we are seeing some risk. We're not going to reject the deal, but we would like for you to apply certain mitigation measures to help reduce the national security risk. That could mean a variety of things, including making sure that uh, the U.S. business um, imposes uh, certain protections around uh, the personal data of U.S. citizens, uh, enhancing their cybersecurity practices, uh, their data protection policies and procedures, um, you know, segregating data so that it's not accessed by foreign investors. Those are just a few sort of examples of mitigation measures. There's also a risk that CFIUS could come back after an initial filing and say, look, well, we, we need more time to look at this and we need more information and so please refile. Now that, that type of option prolongs the CFIUS process. It makes it somewhat more um, sort of clunky and frustrating for certain companies, for investors, and what would otherwise have been you know, a two-month process or a 30-day process could be extended into a six-month process. Or in the case of, you know, certain Chinese investors, we've seen it um, go up to a year, if not longer. And so, you know, that, you know, timing uh, could impact the closings uh, of investment deals, especially in instances uh, where obtaining CFIUS approval is a condition to close. Um, CFIUS could also come back and say, look, we are very concerned with this situation, with this investment or this acquisition of a U.S. business, and we're seeing a national security risk that cannot be mitigated, and CFIUS could then strongly recommend that the parties withdraw. If the parties decide to disregard CFIUS's uh, recommendation, uh, then CFIUS would then hand over that uh, the review package to the president, who will then have 15 days in which to make a determination as to whether or not he will suspend, prohibit, divest, or unwind the transaction. And typically, when CFIUS recommends to the president that he do so, he, he will follow CFIUS's recommendation. Um, now, of course, in the context of the current administration, uh, the level of predictability in that context can be somewhat tricky. Uh, but so far, um, you know, there, there have been instances where uh, the president has uh, rejected um, investments in U.S. businesses. And so most companies end up uh, following CFIUS's recommendation to voluntarily withdraw from the investment rather than to have it go all the way up to the president and then to start receiving, um, you know, adverse press releases and press reports regarding this um, because once it hits the president's desk, then obviously it, it tends to receive more uh, attention. And then from an investor's perspective, uh, receiving adverse um, scrutiny in this context could um, impact future investment opportunities and could almost put a scarlet letter on that investor with respect to U.S. businesses. U.S. businesses will uh, associate that type of foreign investor as one that has already uh, rubbed CFIUS in an adverse way, and as a result, that investor may be less attractive to the U.S. business as, as a potential participant in an investment round. So one of the key questions is, you know, when does CFIUS have jurisdiction to review transactions? You know, obviously CFIUS doesn't have the ability to review every single foreign investment in the United States, uh, but its its jurisdiction, it, its scope is very, very broad. Uh, CFIUS, um, CFIUS's jurisdiction covers what the regulations refer to as covered transactions. That means uh, investments, acquisitions, mergers, certain types of joint ventures, leases, uh, that could result in the control of a U.S. business by a foreign person. In this context, control covers majority as well as, in some cases, a dominant minority interest that the foreign person gains in the U.S. business. Under the regulations, um, you know, instances where the foreign person uh, will gain um, 10 percent, uh, sorry, more than 10 percent uh, of the voting interest uh, of a U.S. business can constitute uh, sufficient, a sufficient basis uh, upon which CFIUS could assert its jurisdiction. In other cases, even if uh, the foreign investor has 10% or less uh, of the voting interest but gains a board seat, uh, 
uh, or uh, has um, certain veto or decision-making powers in relation to important matters impacting the U.S. business, then on that basis, uh, CFIUS can assert a jurisdiction, even if we're talking about a 2% voting interest uh, that results in a board deed. And, and so, again, that's a very good, very clear uh, act, um, sort of uh, example of where CFIUS's jurisdiction to review these transactions is very, very broad. Uh, separate from that, um, you know, recent legislation, uh, FIRMA in particular, has expanded CFIUS's ability to review non-controlling investments, and we'll be talking about that. And then finally, uh, as a result of FIRMA and regulations that just went into effect last week, CFIUS also has jurisdiction in relation to reviewing uh, foreign investments in re U.S. real estate, even if uh, the transaction does not involve the acquisition or an investment in a U.S. business. So what non-controlling investments are subject to U.S. jurisdiction, to CFIUS uh, jurisdiction? So FIRMA, the new regulations that we've uh, mentioned before, uh, have provided CFIUS with jurisdiction to review non-controlling investments, minority investments, that afford a foreign person the following abilities in relation to a U.S. business involved with critical infrastructure, critical technologies, or sensitive personal data. Uh, those types of businesses are, are known as TID uh, businesses. And basically, if a foreign investor gains, the, uh, gains any access to material, non-public technical information in the possession of the U.S. business or membership or, or observer rights in the board of directors, uh, or the right to nominate an individual or board, uh, or any involvement other than through the voting of shares and substantive decision-making regarding technology, infrastructure, or data of U.S. citizens, then in those circumstances, CIPIs can assert uh, jurisdiction irrespective of how large or small the voting interest is that the, the foreign person gains. And so, you know, this is an area that a lot of foreign investors sort of tend to trip up on. They tend to conclude that, you know, they're going in as, as a minority investor uh, and they may not necessarily trigger CFIUS review. Uh, but if they happen to check any of these other boxes, uh, then CFIUS does have the ability to assert jurisdiction and to approach those investors and ask them why they haven't done, why they haven't submitted um, a filing. In the context of um, uh, funds, uh, the CFIUS regulations now uh, go into some detail, and, and this is in response to a lot of questions involving U.S. funds uh, that have foreign LPs as participants. And the big concern there is whether a U.S. fund uh, that uh, engages in uh, investments in U.S. businesses uh, would trigger CFIUS jurisdiction by virtue of the fact that they have foreign LPs on their advisory committee or their advisory boards. And the new CFIUS regulations have and now addressed this and, and they've basically stated that those types of situations will not necessarily trigger CFIUS jurisdiction if you satisfy certain conditions. Uh, some of those conditions include ensuring that the fund is exclusively managed by a general partner that is not a foreign person, i.e. Uh, the GP needs to be a U.S. person. Um, the foreign LP uh, must not have the ability to control the fund's investment decisions or the GP's decisions regarding the portfolio companies. The foreign LP must not have the ability to unilaterally dismiss or retain the GP or determine the GP's compensation. And the foreign LP must not have access to material non-public technical information as a result of its advisory board participation. Now, um, you know, this is a very narrow exemption to CFIUS jurisdiction. In addition to that, it only applies in instances where the fund is engaging in non-controlling investments. In instances where the fund will have a control position in relation to a portfolio company, then this particular exemption uh, may not necessarily be available. And, and so again, um, you know, it's a very good example where uh, um, uh, where the CFIUS regulations provide a little bit of rope, but then pull some of it back. And so again, it, it's very important to understand the nuances within the regulations and to understand the ins and outs of them. Uh, 
So as mentioned before, uh, there are certain cases where investors and uh, the target company must file a mandatory declaration of the CFIUS. A declaration is a short form filing with CFIUS. It, it consists of about five pages. And um, prior to the new regulations that went into effect last week, there was a pilot program that uh, basically required parties to submit the mandatory declaration in relation to investments in critical technology companies. The new regulations that went into effect have now adopted the pilot program in full and, and continue to apply them. And, and basically, a mandatory declaration uh, applies if all of the following uh, conditions are satisfied. First, the U.S. business that's going to be receiving the investment uh, produces, designs, tests, manufactures a critical technology. Again, that is a technology subject to U.S. export controls. The second item is that the critical technology is utilized in connection with the U.S. businesses' activities in one or more uh, relevant industries, uh, or is specifically designed for use by another party in one or more relevant industries. And one of the slides after this lists those industries. And then finally, um, the foreign investor has to engage in either a controlling or a certain type of non-controlling investment, which involves, again, access to uh, non-public information, membership, observer rights, on the board or involvement with substantive decision making. Now, um, we've listed three requirements there, and in order to trigger this particular mandatory declaration, you have to check all three of these boxes. If you don't check all three of these boxes, if you only check two of the three, uh, then on that basis, one could argue that the mandatory declaration is not triggered, which is good news for everyone. Um, but you would still need to determine whether uh, to file uh, with CFIUS on a voluntary basis as part of a risk mitigation strategy. So here's the list of the 27 industries that are relevant to the mandatory declaration requirement. As you can see, most of these industries focus on manufacturing uh, activity, um, but some of them are also in, in the life sciences space. Um, you know, research and development, biotech, research and development, nanotechnology. Um, and so, you know, the, it, it really does cross several sectors here. See a little bit of a lag on our slides. So voluntary notices, so as mentioned before, separate from you know a mandatory filing, uh, there are circumstances where parties may also want to submit uh, a filing to CIFIS on a voluntary basis. And uh, until recently, one could only submit a long form detailed notice to CIFIS on a voluntary basis. But just last week with the, um, with the adoption and the implementation of new regulations, uh, one could also or alternatively file a voluntary declaration, which is a short form filing with CFIUS, which uh, you know, hopefully makes things easier for investors, especially investors that have already undergone a CFIUS review in relation to another deal and have received CFIUS' sort of blessing on that deal. They may feel more confident in relation to just submitting a short form declaration to CFIUS, uh, informing them of the new deal that they're doing. Uh, now, the decision as far as whether or not to file a voluntary notice is essentially a business decision, but you know, you've got your lawyers and your business folks looking at the corporate diligence uh, materials and, and looking at a variety of factors that could either um, help motivate the parties to submit a voluntary notice or declaration, or could be used as sort of devising a list of defenses in case the parties determine that, hey, you know, the, the risk here isn't all that significant, and, but, and in addition to that, we've got a list of data points that we could use to defend our decision uh, not to file. And, um, and so that could be um, something to look out for. Now, typically, the factors that we're seeing in practice uh, involve whether the target company, of course, is involved in, the, in those TID sectors, you know, technology, infrastructure, or data, or if the target company is involved with sensitive agreements with the U.S. government. So, uh, targets that, uh, you know, participate in classified activities, classified contracts with the U.S. government, it's going to be very, very difficult for one to uh, argue against submitting a voluntary filing to CFIUS in those cases. Um, also, if, you know, the target is 
you know, located close to a sensitive government facility or military base, or if the investor is affiliated with a non-U.S. government, and yeah, that could those could be factors that could elevate the CFIUS risk. And, and again, you'd want to account for that in your um, in your matrix, if you will, uh, before submitting uh, the notice. Now, of course, you know these four factors that we have on the slide. It's not an exhaustive list. There are several other factors that go into the mix, um, but but these are some core areas that you'd want to account for in the course of your diligence and, and your decision matrix as far as submitting a voluntary notice is concerned. So, what are the upsides and downsides of submitting a voluntary notice? So, as mentioned before, CFIUS is not subject to any statute of limitations. So if you're a foreign investor and you made an investment in, in, in a company, you didn't perform CFIUS diligence, or you did, and you decided not to file with CFIUS, you know, that investment in some circumstances could continue to be subject to CFIUS jurisdiction on a foregoing basis. Uh, CFIUS at any time, whether it's a few months or a couple of years or five years later or what have you, could approach the parties and ask them, hey, you made that investment back in 2015 and you never told us about it. And, you know, we've got some concerns about this, but can you please explain to us why you didn't submit um, a notice or a declaration with us? And if the parties do not have a plausible explanation, a reasonable explanation as to why they didn't submit the filing, then CFIUS could direct them uh, to submit the filing. However, if the, if the parties had submitted a filing and received CFIUS's no objection, then that no objection would act as a safe harbor and protect the parties from CFIUS challenges in the future, which is all good news. But that's all, of course, assuming that CFIUS will approve the deal. Um, potential downsides of filing with CFIUS? Well, you know, preparing a voluntary notice or a declaration, it could take some time. It involves some uh, legal fees. It involves some effort. It involves interactions with CFIUS. It involves um, greater interaction between the investor and uh, the target company. Um, in addition to that, CFIUS might come back after the filing and tell the parties that, okay, well, we're okay with this investment, but we'd like for the company to implement certain mitigation measures that we discussed before. And in some cases, those mitigation measures, you know, might make the investment or the acquisition, you know, less desirable uh, for the investor. Um, you know, it, you know, especially if we're talking about a strategic investor that's going into the investment thinking that they're going to somehow uh, benefit from the technology of the target company, and if if this is later on telling them that no, um, you won't be able to access uh, that that technology, or you won't be able to access the data uh, that the target company has in its possession, then you know that could render the deal meaningless to the investor from a business perspective. And then finally, of course, uh, you know, Cipius always has the ability to tell the parties that no, we don't like this. We're going to tell the, the president to block it unless, of course, you guys decide to voluntarily withdraw from uh, the deal. Now, what makes CFIUS somewhat challenging is that, you know, in the prior slide, we mentioned that there are several parties to the committee's process. And many of those, some of those parties are, you know, part of national security agencies that have access to information that's not in the public realm. They have access to information that neither you nor I will ever uh, be able to learn of, and, and however, they will be able to advise CFIUS um, in a manner that could somehow harm uh, the deal, that could somehow cause CFIUS to conclude to block the deal, and CFIUS is under no obligation to tell the investor or the company uh, its, its rationale for blocking the deal. And so what could otherwise appear to be uh, a fairly uh, straightforward deal to an investor uh, could raise some complicated national security risks to CFIUS that CFIUS is not going to uh, educate the investor on. And so that is another sort of area that you know, causes some frustration in the CFIUS uh, area, um, you know, the fact that CFIUS can be opaque in its decision-making process. So what have been the recent sort of legislative regulatory developments? So FIRMA, as mentioned before, is the primary statute that, that has come into play now fully it was adopted in, in 2018, subject to additional regulations. Those new regulations have now finally come into force last week. There are two regulations now that have come into force that basically revamped 
uh, the CFIUS regulations, the prior regulations, they're known as provisions pertaining to certain investments in the United States by foreign persons. And then separate from that, there are new regulations that focus exclusively on real estate investments. Um, we are also expecting additional changes to U.S. export controls. This is something that FIRMA contemplated. And when those new export control uh, rules come into play, they are going to not only impact uh, U.S. trade, but they're also going to impact CFTS as well, because I mentioned before, CFTS is very much focused on investments in U.S. critical technology companies. And critical technology is tied specifically to how a technology is classified for U.S. export control purposes. And it is contemplated that new export control regulations are going to expand um, the types of technologies that will be deemed critical. So the new CFTS regulations that have come into play, um, you know, bring about a few changes. And here are just some highlights uh, of the core changes. So first of all, they've strengthened uh, CFTS's jurisdiction with respect to certain non-controlling investments, especially those investments that involve the TID businesses, technology, infrastructure, and data. They also expand the requirement for parties to file a mandatory declaration in instances where the investor has foreign government affiliation. Um, what's also interesting is the new regulations have created an, a new exemption that we haven't seen before that apply uh, in instances, this is a limited exemption, they apply in instances uh, involving non-controlling transactions where the investor is from Australia, Canada, uh, or the United Kingdom. Those are the three countries that have been specified in the CFTS regulations for now. Uh, we haven't seen other countries just yet, but, but that list can change. The new regulations also introduce a new option uh, for transaction parties to submit a short form voluntary declaration instead of the more substantial notice that we discussed before. And then finally, they enable CFTS to review foreign investments in U.S. real estate. So in relation to CFTS's expanded jurisdiction, um, you know, this scope uh, now enhances CFTS's review of covered transactions to include non-controlling investments by foreign persons, irrespective of their voting percentage, um, in instances where, where they are looking at TID businesses. Now, a TID business, again, uh, are U.S. businesses that produce design, manufacture, fabricate, or develop one or more critical technologies, or own, operate, manufacture, supply, or service critical infrastructure. And there are several examples in the regulations uh, of that. Uh, or they maintain or collect directly or indirectly sensitive personal data of U.S. citizens. The personal data uh, sort of hook, again, uh, can specifically target social media um, companies uh, that are seeking to attract uh, foreign investment uh, or fintech uh, companies that have access to uh, broad information regarding the financial health of U.S. citizens. The CFIUS regulations also impose a new mandatory declaration. Uh, so they preserve the prior one that applies in the context of critical technologies, but they also require uh, that a mandatory declaration be submitted uh, in instances where um, a transaction will result in a foreign government acquiring a substantial interest in certain U.S. businesses, specifically the TID businesses. This mandatory declaration uh, is triggered in instances where a foreign government-controlled entity acquires 25% or more of the voting interest in the TID business unless the foreign government is from an accepted foreign state, which I've mentioned before, uh, covers Australia, Canada, and the United Kingdom at this stage. Um, the term foreign government control uh, entity includes entities that are 49% or more controlled by a, a foreign government. So what is this exemption that applies to those friendly countries, uh, Australia, Canada, and the United Kingdom? So the new regulations have introduced the concept of an accepted foreign state. Uh, and basically, accepted investors from those states are exempt from CFIUS jurisdiction, but only in situations where the transaction involves a non-controlling investment. 
In instances where a transaction will result in a foreign investor gaining a controlling interest in a U.S. business, then this exemption will not apply under the regulations. And so, um, although it's, it's very heartening to see that that CFIUS is um, uh, going to take a, a less aggressive approach in relation to investors from Australia, Canada, and the UK, we also need to be mindful that you know, this exemption has its limitations. Uh, it doesn't apply across the board. And if there are instances where uh, Australian or Canadian or UK investors are either going to acquire outright or gain a controlling interest uh, in a U.S. business, that this exemption will not apply. What's interesting and what was surprising to some people is that the new regulations don't exempt countries that are traditionally viewed as U.S. allies like Germany, Japan, and Korea. However, uh, not all is lost. Uh, the regulations contemplate uh, that CFIUS is going to be developing uh, processes, uh, procedures for updating the list of accepted foreign states. And what that means is that if Australia, Canada, and the UK um, at some point or another aren't able to meet a mark set by CFIUS, then they could fall off of the list. And what it also means is that other countries that meet the mark, meet a standard set by CFIUS, can find themselves on that list. And so there's still some hope for other countries to join uh, the league of accepted um, foreign states. So real estate investments. This is another area that you know, the new regulations address. There is a separate uh, set of regulations that focus on this. Under the new regulations, cities could review foreign investments in certain types of real estate, even if there's no US business associated with that property. Prior to the new regulations, CFIUS's jurisdiction was only limited in instances where foreign investments focused on US businesses. Um, it did not necessarily cover instances where uh, the uh, where a foreign investor was acquiring real estate on its own. And now the new regulations change that. Um, and basically what they say is that if he has jurisdiction to review the purchase, lease, or concession of certain types of real estate, not all, but certain types of real estate that provide a foreign investor with three or more of the following rights, physical access to the property, exclusion of others from physically accessing the property, improvement or development of a property or fixing structures or objects to the property. So again, good example of the ins and outs of the regulations. They, they don't apply across the board. In addition to that, the regulations contain exemptions uh, for certain types of transactions involving single housing units, urbanized areas, or urban clusters. Um, and also the accepted um, foreign state exception that, that we mentioned before. Uh, could apply in this context uh, as well. What is interesting about the real estate uh, regulations that have come into play uh, last week is that uh, they don't impose a mandatory uh, filing uh, with CFIUS. And so uh, the real estate investment regime is primarily voluntary uh, at this stage. So what makes the CFIUS process challenging for foreign investors? And as mentioned before, you know, you know there, there are concerns as far as CFIUS reviews uh, causing delays to the closing of the deal. Uh, typically, uh, parties that submit a voluntary notice uh, would specify that obtaining CFIUS approval is a condition to close, which is a smart way of handling it. It helps mitigate the uh, foreign investor's exposure. And then, of course, in instances where a mandatory declaration is triggered, the, the CFIUS regulations actually require the parties to submit uh, the notice uh, prior to closing uh, the deal. And CFIUS then has 30 days in which to review uh, the declaration. Um, other areas, CFIUS's jurisdiction is very broad, as we mentioned before. It covers both you know, acquisitions, controlling investments, and then also now certain non-controlling investments. The CFIUS has got a very aggressive position uh, on that. Um, when conducting its reviews, CFIUS accounts for a variety of factors, including those that I mentioned before, um, factors pertaining to national security implications that neither you nor I have access to. Uh, and then, of course, CFIUS has no obligation to explain to parties why they decided to reject the deal. Uh, and so, in some ways, it could feel like you're trying to, um, you know, uh, navigate a maze while wearing a, bl a blindfold, essentially. Um, 
And then finally, you know, the, the, the new regulations contemplate um, additional CFIUS regulations being implemented in the future, uh, especially in the export control uh, area. And so that adds, again, a certain amount of uncertainty uh, to the mix. So what are the key issues that foreign investors need to be uh, aware of when looking at um, you know, these, these types of investments? And so obviously the core question is whether the CFIUS risk is, is so significant that, that it could impact uh, your tender if indeed you're participating in a competitive bid situation. Uh, there can be circumstances where, in a, where a foreign investor could be a, at a disadvantage compared to a U.S. Uh, investor, uh, and, and so you'd want to want to think that through uh, more clearly at, at the outset of the deal and, and perform some preliminary diligence, and then and then come up with strategies to help make your bid more attractive uh, to the U.S. company. In some cases, uh, the U.S. company may add. A price premium uh, in relation to the potential CFIUS risk associated um, uh, with a foreign investor, especially Chinese investors. Uh, and so that's almost a given now uh, in instances involving companies that are involved in the TID areas, especially. Um, we're seeing CFIUS concerns being addressed uh, in term sheets, LOIs, uh, pre signing due diligence. We, we receive a lot of requests from foreign investors asking us to eyeball potential deals and to tell them on that basis whether you know there's any risk that just jumps out based on the facts and circumstances of the company itself. And typically we are able to, to do that if, if we are aware that a particular target company is involved in sensitive industries or have sensitive government contracts in play. And, and those are you know some of the easy ways to uh, address CFIUS risk very early uh, in the deal. Uh, other questions, uh, that investors need to ask themselves is how does CFIUS, how will CFIUS impact the cost of the deal? You know, if indeed a, a, um, a filing will be made, um, in certain circumstances, if the filing can, can be fairly extensive, the process can be extensive, and it could add to the cost of doing the deal. And so you want to account for that in your cost benefit uh, analysis. And then finally, if, you know, if there are significant concerns per, you know, pertaining to a particular deal, then you know a strategic investor may either want to reconsider engaging the deal altogether, which is not you know always you know the preferred course, but if but if that's the course, then it has to be the course. Uh, or you know one might be able to structure the deal so that um, uh, it, it could appear to be a passive financial investment at, at, at the outset, and then maybe have a second closing pursuant to which. Um, you know, the non-passive ownership rights kick in, and that's where you seek the CFIUS approval. And that gives you some flexibility as far as participating in an investment around early on as a um, passive financial investor and ensuring that um, capital flows through uh, into a promising company that would otherwise have to shut down the lights tomorrow if they don't receive your money, uh, while also avoiding uh, triggering CFIUS's wrath by asserting control rights or certain non-controlling rights um, that would raise concerns for CFIUS. And so we're, we're seeing two-step closings in certain deals. And then finally, uh, you know, foreign investors need to think through, you know, national security risk mitigation strategies. So, for instance, if you do identify a concern at the outset, uh, but before you submit your declaration or notice, in an effort to put the best sort of explanation, the best spin on the, on the investment, both the investor and the target company uh, might be able to think through ways to the ring sense sensitive data technology from uh, access uh, by the um, foreign investor and, and and anticipate concerns that cities may may raise in advance, and that could you know create great rapport with cities and can help smooth out the process that may otherwise be somewhat bumpy. Those mitigation strategies, you know, again they cover a variety. Uh, of areas that we've uh, sort of uh, addressed earlier. Uh, but again, th th there's some creativity that goes into that process. And so that's, uh, you know, I'm going to conclude our discussion there. And, you know, if there are any questions that you have, we're, we're more than happy to um, uh, address them. And in addition to that, I've inserted my email address here. And, and um, you know, feel free to reach out to us. If if you have any follow-on questions, uh, we're always happy to be uh, a resource uh, to members in the investment community. 
we all sort of sympathize and understand that these can present um, significant regulatory challenges, but it's always important to take uh, a strategic approach to this, to think through uh, you know, CFIUS in a creative manner, uh, to not jump necessarily to conclusions that all investment in the U.S. Uh, in one shape or another have been blocked as a result of CFIUS. Uh, as the prior slides and statistics have clearly demonstrated that the Chinese are you know, continuing to invest in the United States in one shape or another. Uh, and so that's a good sort of indication that, um, that investors are thinking through creative ways to achieve uh, their business strategies. So again, thank you very much for your uh, time and we really appreciate this opportunity to present to you. Thank you very much, uh, Danish. Um, it, it's really fascinating and uh, really great that you uh, that you found the time to present uh, to us all these um, details and intricacies of uh, of CFIUS and, and the whole um, regulatory review process uh, that is in place. Recently, we did uh, we did see um, President Trump and uh, the administration block uh, what could have been the biggest acquisition in history. Uh, in other words, the bid of Broadcom to acquire Qualcomm, um, and it, it was it was quite clear, um, I would say, what the uh, concerns were, and in a sense, as Qualcomm is um, heavily betting on 5G technologies that are really really critical um, to U.S. communications and U.S. Uh, national securities and. Uh, could access to, to those those sorts of types of technologies uh, to foreign uh, foreign players may may potentially uh, harm national U.S. national security. So I, you know, however, during your presentation, you mentioned some uh, some examples of uh, of things that you normally wouldn't expect. You did mention TikTok and 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 Grindr. Would you be able to share with us very briefly what are some of the um, least usual or um, the unusual suspect, so, so to speak, uh, um, in that you've seen in your practice, uh, kind of thing, or that, that uh, other of your colleagues may have seen. Yeah, I mean, we you know, these types of issues come up in a, a variety of instances. Um, you know, for instance, there's been one case where. Um, uh, where a foreign investor was seeking to acquire uh, a food company in the U.S. And, uh, you know, it, 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 initially, you know, we, we, we were asked to, you know, conduct a, a fairly high-level CFIUS review uh, just to check the box and, and to be able to cross it off, off fairly quickly. Um, but as time went on and the diligence became more detailed, uh, we discovered that the food company was actually an exclusive supplier uh, of certain food products uh, to a variety of U.S. military bases in the United States. I see. <laughs> and, so, and so what was otherwise uh, a, a fairly straightforward deal uh, resulted in us taking a harder look to determine you know, whether indeed this, this is something that they would be interested in, whether to mm -hmm. raise an objection that somehow a foreign investor could come in and contaminate the food supply to U.S. military bases, and, and so that's sort of an example where you know something that you know thought you thought would be sort of a plain vanilla type of uh, a deal uh, when you perform the diligence can reveal some other sort of nuances and, and challenges. In that particular case, um, you know, of course, um, you know, we we managed to self police the matter and impose some mitigation. Uh, measures and and uh, um, and so um, you know ultimately I don't think we ended up doing a filing there but what we did do is um, create some measures so that uh, the handling of the food um, you know was uh, limited to US citizens uh, that the foreign investor didn't gain access to the food supply chain um, and so again, a good example where, where you might be able to come with, come up with a creative solution. Of course, that particular deal didn't trigger a mandatory filing. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, all right. Well, it, it's a very, like I said, it's a very fascinating issue. But I'm going to let James, uh, I'm going to let Jim uh, ask uh, some other questions. If, if, or if not, we could uh, read out some of the questions submitted by the audience. Yeah, I'm just mindful of time. I mean, Danish, that's uh, fantastic. 
presentation very comprehensive. Um, that's really straight to that Q&A. We've got one from Julian uh, Jones who says, if the technology of a target company is classified EAR 99, is it enough to rule out a mandatory civil fine? <clears throat> Yeah, I mean, uh, technology that's classified as EAR-99 falls outside of the critical technology um, uh, sort of uh, uh, category. And so one uh, one could use that as a basis to avoid the first mandatory declaration that we discussed. But if it just also happens to be the case that the target company uh, is involved with certain types of critical infrastructure or has access to sensitive data that satisfies conditions in the regulations, then notwithstanding the EAR uh, 99 uh, classification, a mandatory declaration can be triggered if the investor um, is affiliated uh, with uh, a foreign government. And, and so, um, you know, an EAR 99 determination helps you get out of the forest or at least get to the end of the forest, but it may not necessarily allow you to, to leave the forest entirely. And there's still certain other boxes that one would need to check you know, in the course of the assessment. Uh, and typically those boxes um, can be hopefully ruled out fairly quickly. Cool. And then a question from Martin Hemig. Um, two part question this, uh, Dennis. So what does it mean for European and Asian early stage investors, effectively those into pre-revenue or early revenue startups in the sectors they consider sensitive? Uh, perhaps if you take that, you know, maybe just give that real sense of, you know, how much are they looking at the idea, you know, of something that might be impactful, even if it's not necessarily clear because the revenues are or profits aren't there, that it will be impactful. So. Hello, uh, might have lost. Can you hear me? Oh, hello. Yeah. Hello, Jim. Can you hear me? Yeah, we lost you for a second there. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah, I'm sorry. Can you repeat the question? I, there was a bit yeah. of a interruption there. Yeah, no worries. Uh, no worries. A um, question from Martin Hemig, which is, what does this all mean for European and early, Asian early stage investors, basically into pre-revenue or early revenue startups, basically those which maybe have a, a good idea or an idea that could be important, but frankly, it's still too early to tell whether it's going to be significant. Yeah, that's uh, that's a very common sort of issue that we come up with, and and CFIUS, the regulations themselves don't uh, contain any type of materiality sort of requirement when it comes to the revenue of the company or the size of the company. Um, you know what they're really looking at uh, in some cases is the potential of the company. Um, the regulations in some cases also refer to the potential or the or, or the intention of the company to collect uh, data. Um, in excess of a million persons, a million persons that could trigger um, a concern. Um, and then as far as critical technology is concerned, uh, you know, in, in many cases, the early stage companies have an idea, but they haven't quite developed it yet. And it's very difficult to classify that technology because it's still, uh, you know, in someone's head. And so um, really it's the point upon which one has a very clear idea as far as what the technology is going to look like and where uh, it might end up uh, on the on the classification spectrum that that you would want to take uh, take a look at, and then finally, the CFIUS regulations themselves contain a greenfield exemption, which is very very limited. But in instances where you know a foreign person comes into the United States and creates a business out of scratch and you know hires uh, individuals to develop a new technology. Uh, in some cases, if, again, if you satisfy certain boxes in the regulations, an argument could be made that a greenfield ex exemption uh, might be uh, available. Ah, but that might take a, tackle the second part of his question, which is, and so if you're a foreign startup that you're expanding and move into the U.S. and then maybe you get funding, how does it work if you're maybe domiciled in the U.S. or headquartered there versus not, but maybe with you know some subsidiaries or operations in the US? Do you get caught by that or what are the impact? That's an excellent question actually. So if a foreign parent has a US subsidiary and the foreign parent then attracts foreign investment, 
uh, then in, in some circumstances, could he could assert jurisdiction in relation to that foreign investment to the extent that it impacts the U.S. business. And so, um, you know, CFIUS won't necessarily have jurisdiction in relation to the investment in the U.S., sorry, in the foreign parents' international activities outside of the U.S., but CFIUS can assert jurisdiction and review how that foreign investment in the foreign parent could somehow impact the U.S. subsidiary. And so they will inquire as far as whether the U.S. subsidiary is actually engaged in U.S. interstate commerce, whether it's got U.S. government contracts, whether it's developing critical technology in the U.S., or it's involved with, with critical infrastructure or collecting data. Um, and so its sphere, if you will, is focused on that U.S. business. Kalyan, if you're there, we'll close off. But otherwise, I'll le I'll leave it to say thanks very much, Danish, and uh, we'll yeah. we'll prepare for the next one. But Kalyan. All right. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Danish, um, for this uh, wonderful and detailed presentation. Uh, that being said, uh, both the slides and the video recording of this uh, webinar will be made available sometime, probably uh, tomorrow. Um, what I'd like to um, also urge uh, the people um, watching this, uh, either live or afterwards, is uh, to stay tuned for our next uh, webinar in March, which is uh, going to tackle with the industrial uh, sector. So uh, with that, uh, we conclude our presentation. So uh, have a good uh, day, um, evening or afternoon, wherever you might be in the world. Thank you.